This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. So misbehaviour, and particularly violence by students, has stimulated a lot of historical and scholarly discussion over the last few years. And I'd like to start by acknowledging my debt to scholars like Claude Gauvard, Antoine Destenberg, Nathalie Gorhoshoff, Thierry Kouamé, Jacques Verger, Alan Cobham, Jeremy Catto, Peter Denley, Charles Hammer, to name but a very few. I'm very much convinced by their attention to notions of student honour, jurisdictional and institutional rivalries, and political motivation. But my way into this topic has been from a slightly different angle. When I first became interested in students as a group, it became clear that the majority of the source material tells us more about ways in which students were labelled and stereotyped than it does about actual student misbehaviour. It's certainly possible to read these sources against the grain to get a sense of what students were actually doing, but the interaction between the labels and behaviour is a striking one. So I became interested in thinking through the ways in which common stereotypes and tropes of which the perpetrators are most probably well aware, might shape the ways in which perpetrators actually behave. I'm helped here by criminological labelling theory, which is a rather jargon-ridden way of saying that there is indeed a relationship between the ways in which people are categorised by those in authority as deviant and the ways in which they then choose to behave. The theory is not claiming a causal relationship, that stereotypes actually make people misbehave. Clearly causation is far more complex than that, and the stereotypes don't arise in a vacuum anyway. But it is claiming that the forms taken by that violence and misbehaviour, the particular gestures chosen, attitudes towards victims and use of space, can all be shaped by an awareness of the ways in which others preachers, parents, university authorities, royal and judicial authorities, were talking in usually very negative terms about students. So if violence and misbehaviour are partly about constructing and negotiating particular forms of identity, then I think it stands to reason that they would respond to ways in which others categorised and denigrated those identities. What were those stereotypes? So on the one hand, students were regularly denigrated as engaging in senseless violence, anarchic and out of control. They were frequently associated with uncontrolled sexuality and dealings with prostitutes. And on the other hand, quite differently, an idealised notion of the student circulated very widely. In manuals of behaviour, such as that of the Pseudo-Boethius or William of Tournay, And prescriptions were reiterated in college and university statutes, which followed the Codex Justinianus in insisting that, quote, masters of studies and doctors must excel first in morals and then in eloquence. However, these aspirational labels of dedicated study could easily be turned against students to categorise them as essentially emasculated men of God, so dedicated to esoteric study in ivory towers that they were unable to engage with real political concerns. And we know that university men were aware in the 15th century of these stereotypes and labels. So numerous letters survive from 15th century Oxford University masters attempting to defend themselves both against slurs of anarchic violence and misbehaviour and against the notion that they were politically disengaged and locked in ivory towers. So in a sense, both these polarised stereotypes, the stereotype of anarchic, sexually uncontrolled students, and the idealised stereotype of these very conscientious, chaste men of God, neither of those stereotypes really correspond to what students want to be. Student poetry provides another set of explicit, although extremely complex, responses to stereotypes. For example, the poetry of Eustache Deschamps, or the characterisation of Nicholas in the Canterbury Tales, um, to which we'll return at the end, reiterates such complex responses to the labels. So I have a few caveats um, right at the beginning. 
Clearly not all students behaved in this way. We're talking about a noisy minority. And I'm afraid I don't have any statistics for the proportion of students I'm talking about either. I think that's very problematic. And I am emphatically not claiming that stereotypes in any way caused violence, but rather that responses to such labels shaped the ways in which it was carried out. Students were at a transitional stage in their lives, often away from home for the first time, as young as 14 and uncertain of their place in the world. So it's not surprising that they should have been particularly concerned about establishing a sense of identity and equally that the two polarised stereotypes with which they normally tended to be categorised, the anarchically violent and the otherworldly emasculated cleric, were not particularly appealing, even though some aspects could be empowering. And I'm hoping to show how, in their misbehaviour, students responded to these polls and tried to negotiate more empowering identities. So I'll be focusing on Oxford in the 15th century, but as Frédéric said, this is part of a larger project comparing student violence and misbehaviour in Oxford, Paris and Heidelberg. So I will sometimes touch on these comparisons with a view to illuminating what's specific about actions and misbehaviour in Oxford and how this might be connected to the particular institutional and social context of the English university. And likewise, I'll refer a little to the 13th and 14th centuries in order to try to pinpoint what's specific about the situation of the 15th century. So, a bit of context, which is probably very obvious. Oxford was a small town in the 15th century, in very stark contrast to Paris. The university in Oxford was always going to be the dominant entity, um, and was until the foundation of the Morris Car Factory in 1912. There was no flourishing international trade in Oxford and no centre of diplomacy or royal court with which to compete. Indeed, over the course of the Middle Ages, the privileges of the university vis-à-vis the town increased dramatically. The St Scholastica's Day Massacre of 1355 ensured that the jurisdictional preeminence of the university was in future unchallenged. Nevertheless, Oxford, um, the university in Oxford did also suffer during this period. After its association with the Lollard heresy um, in the late 14th, early 15th centuries, the university became a closely, <coughs> closely watched and very morally repressive institution. Comments from within the university point to a sense of decline um, owing to the effects of war, even if a war essentially fought on foreign shores could never engender the kind of immediate suffering which was felt in Paris. Oxford University had never been a particularly cosmopolitan student uh, university sorry, and differed dramatically from Paris in this respect. There were foreign students at Oxford, but they were always in a minority. Oxford had only two loosely defined nations, quote-unquote, of northerners and southerners, um, again in contrast to Paris. Nevertheless, numbers um, of foreigners declined still further in the 15th century, and French students in particular were understandably reluctant to consider st studying in such a hostile land during the Hundred Years' War, obviously. By the 15th century, Oxford still had a panoply of residential halls, but a number of colleges were founded over the course of the 15th century, often to favour a particular educational programme, and most importantly, to enforce discipline. And as in Paris, greater numbers of students were eschewing careers in the church in the 15th century in order rather to pursue the lucrative possibilities of government service. And violence and misbehaviour were prosecuted in Oxford in a very particular way. Oxford students were subject to the reasonably efficient Chancellor's Court and effective discipline was also exercised through the colleges. The records of the Chancellor's Court, as well as many of these discipline books and enactments from Parliament, survive to provide a fairly rounded picture. Furthermore, we've got manuals of student behaviour, sermons, student poetry and letters, providing insights into both processes of stereotyping and students' responses to these stereotypes. <coughs> so I propose to examine four main areas of student identity um, Peer groups, first of all, town versus gown, um, gender, and then geographical provenance. 
and to think about how types of misbehaviour and violence within these kinds of areas of, of analysis, I suppose, were shaped by a desire to negotiate the labels imposed upon students. Okay, so first of all, peer groups. So in terms of stereotypes, existing labels presented students with a choice between being groups of drunken louts or pious intellectual communities. So we've got these two very conflicting stereotypes. Neither label on its own was particularly empowering, for obvious reasons, but students manipulated them in sophisticated ways. <coughs> in both Paris and Oxford, students frequently strutted around together, fully armed. On the one hand, this was about rejecting the notion that they were locked away in ivory towers. On the other, it was about impressing friends and demonstrating one's masculinity, to the extent that one student in Oxford was accused merely of boasting that he possessed a bow and arrows. As Antoine d'Estombert has so convincingly demonstrated, honour was a central concept in motivating violence. And honour clearly is a motivation which responded to stereotypes of students. This was about demonstrating that students were not just anarchic individuals, but had convincing and cogent codes of honour with their own form of rationality, that they formed part of rationally constituted peer groups, and that they weren't simply locked away in their rooms. Um, as many seem to be claiming. So in Oxford, the register of Merton College, actually, I, sh I can show you on the map, just to um, set these things in context. So Merton College is, is here. Okay. So the register of Merton College attests to numerous incidents of more petty violence explicitly motivated by the need to avenge an insult. The case of William Ireland, who insulted and hit Master Adams in 1494 in response to opprobrious comments, is typical. In both cases, riotous students made a point of disturbing the studies of the conscientious, inverting existing moralities and stereotypes <coughs> by suggesting that too much study deserved punishment. Much violence arose from the over-exuberance of student games. A murder during a game of dice in Oxford in 1442 provided an opportunity for the students concerned to claim that this was not merely irrational, but motivated by the need to defend honour, and moreover that serious harm was never intended. And of course, much of this violence was exacerbated by drink. And it's quite an interesting contrast, I think, between Oxford and Paris in this respect. Whereas religious parody through drinking songs which mimicked liturgical practice was quite common in Paris, in Oxford, drunken parodies more often focused on secular targets. And I think this is maybe because in Oxford, religious parody was too closely associated with heresy, um, which is obviously a, a very problematic issue in the first half of the 15th century. And where student violence did centre on religious issues... Um, in Oxford, it tended to be of an entirely serious nature, such as contesting an excommunication. So in Oxford, rather, students carried out sometimes violent mimicries of princely banquets in Merton College, again negotiating labels, positing them as either irrationally drunken or conscientiously closeted in their rooms. The use of space in both Oxford and Paris is rather striking, I think, and there are some instructive contrasts here between violence by Oxford students and that by Parisians. If space is largely a socially constructed phenomenon, um, and I think most people now following figures like Lefebvre would probably agree, the ways in which it is used, exploited and negotiated can tell us a lot about the ways in which students were trying to project particular kinds of identity and to negotiate the stereotypes imposed upon them. Whereas in Paris, these groups plagued the city streets, the very different geography of Oxford is evoked in the frequent accusation of illicit hunting outside the city. The smaller town of Oxford and its closer links with the surrounding countryside particularly in social terms, as the aristocracy of the surrounding county provided students with aspirational nightly models, meant that the space of the countryside provided particular opportunities for misbehaviour and particular opportunities for projecting a kind of nightly identity. 
1417, hunting went one stage further and turned into a fully-fledged student riot in Ifley, a small village just outside Oxford. Um, again, I can show you on the, on the map roughly where Ifley is, if I can see where my little arrow's gone. Um, so uh, Ifley village is, is uh, way over here. Anyway, Ifley is now famous because it's got a lovely Norman church and it's a very beautiful Thameside setting. It seems in 1417 it was a site of pretty extreme violence. The students deliberately mimicked knightly forms, even subverting and mocking them. And they left Oxford, quote, armed with a breastplate, a pair of palted gloves, vambrace and rarebrace, a pricking pallet with three ostrich feathers fixed in it, a launce and a Carlisle axe. So this really is the, the weapons and the armoury of, of knightly war. And the ostrich feather is particularly interesting. This may well have been a parody of the Black Prince's badge, um, which involved three ostrich feathers and the motto, Ich diene, so I serve. I thought it would be helpful now just to trace the movements um, of students looking on the maps um, in Oxford and Paris, just to get a sense of how these contrasts work within the towns. Um, so we'll start off with Paris. So here's a, a large map of most of Paris. You can see the whole Cartier Latin there. And here we're kind of zooming in on the, um, on the bit where students were particularly misbehaving. In 1470, one master, Hugues Ongou, was woken from sleep in his hostel in the Rue des Noyers. So we are, oh, I've lost my arrow, here. Is it working when I do that? Yes. In the Rue des Noyers. He was woken by loud and insulting singing outside his window. Unable to sleep and unable to endure the insults to his masculinity um, from these singers, and knowing the perpetrators to be old rivals, he woke his friend and they both went out into the street in their nightgowns. They walked as far as the, as the corner of the Rue des Anglais, so uh, they went to here, here's the Rue des Anglais, but they couldn't see their disturbers, so they went back inside to get dressed properly. Then they went out again, and they saw their enemies at the end of the Rue des Plastriers, here. Unwilling to confront them directly, they passed on to the Place Maubert, here, a small square lined with student hostels and brothels. Then they decided to take the long way round back to their hostel to avoid being spotted by their enemies and to avoid provoking a fight. So they passed by the Rue des Lavandières, here, Rue des Noyers, and then back up the Rue des Anglais. Then turning down the Rue des Plastriers again, they returned to their hostel via the Rue Saint-Jacques. So they went back this way, and then here. But just as they were returning to their hostel, they saw their enemies coming out from the Rue des Anglais, here. At some point, though, at this point, sorry, some other people appeared from the Rue des Clos-Primaux, here. And the aggressors fled down the Rue Clobrimo and hid. The men who'd been woken then chased their enemies round until they get back to the Place Maubert, here, where they caught up with them outside the tavern of Les Trois Aches. Les Trois Aches, sorry. At this point, the insulting singer tried to hit Hugues Anceau on the head, but Hugues defended himself with a stone and the man was killed. Not realising this, Hugues then returned to his hostel. Or at least, this is the very detailed account which Hugues himself gives us. So it's not necessarily what happened, clearly. This is the way in which he defends his actions because he ended up killing the other man. And the story of self-defence is supported spatially by the implication that he went out of his way physically to avoid a confrontation, hence all this detail about which streets he went down. The choice of these streets by the original offenders, the singer and his friends, endeavour to draw on their connotations of innocent student mischief in order to contest stereotypes of students as demonically inspired and socially threatening. But at the same time, by placing themselves so explicitly amongst the hostels of the student quarter, where similar events had previously taken place, and where student rivalries between hostels were notorious, the perpetrators refused to allow their violence to be dismissed as meaningless. So my point is, by using this, these particular streets in, in 
quite conscious and deliberate ways, they're in a sense contesting both these sets of stereotypes. In Oxford, the peer group violence within the city, so when they're not off hunting outside the city, within the city, it was far more focused on the geography of the various colleges and hostels or at least it's focused on the colleges and hostels in the way they describe it, and in a sense that's the point, I think. And movement through space in acts of violence can be seen as movement between a series of nodal points, in a sense, so the colleges. The main rivalries in Oxford were between colleges and halls, which increasingly functioned as centres of loyalty, and which already had achieved far more institutional and structural significance, I think, than their counterparts in Paris. So, for example, in 1446, John Skellett and John Snowden from Broad, Broadgate Hall, uh, which is uh, here, you can see, just uh, south of Aldates, um, they were obliged to give the kiss of peace to their long-standing enemies, Richard Pedd and Thomas Ashfield of Paul's Hall, which is oh, it's over here, so close by. So violence had inv involved movement from one hall to the other, encroaching on the space of their victims. Ongoing feuds between halls or colleges were also quite common. Evidence survives from as late as 1512 of a feud between Peckwater Inn, which is uh, here, Peckwater Inn is here, and London College, which is here. Sorry, it's not marked on this map, but it's roughly there with students regularly invading, and that's a, a quote, invading the space of the other hall. Even when a student was acting alone, he might cite his loyalty to his college as the reason, as, for example, in 1459, when John Smart of Gloucester College, here, hit John Alden of Oriel College, here, over the head with a stick. So in this context, students emphasised their deep loyalties in visual and spatial terms, and contested labels stigmatising them as unworldly, with no real sense of loyalty, but also dodged labels categorising their violence as meaningless, whilst exploiting the fear and attention that such stereotypes generated. Now turning to the second kind of identity, um, that is town versus gown. Students were also highly conscious of the specificity of their position as transitional, young, apparently intellectually superior and socially distinct. And of course, we would expect to find this kind of identity enacted in town versus gown disputes. In the 13th and 14th centuries, this seems indeed to have been the case, and the work of Charles Hammer has been particularly instructive here. In engaging in such disputes, students could claim a powerful identity for themselves and contest stereotypes which suggested either that their misbehaviour was just anarchic playfulness or that they were disengaged men of God. Collective violence was not infrequent in 14th century Oxford and the majority was caused by growing antagonism between town and gown. And in many ways I think these were class tensions so which were being articulated. An apparently privileged temporary population of increasingly elevated social status as the century progressed was in many ways likely to attempt to assert its authority and certainly likely to provoke resentment. But there were two very practical issues around which antagonism could um, flourish. And we're talking now in the 14th century. Jurisdiction and the socio-economic question of the assize. And disagreement over this erupted very famously in 1355. So the best secondary account based on the chronicle versions remains that of Hastings Rashtal. Um, and you've got a list, I think, there of the, of the principal chronicle accounts. On the 10th of February, two students named Walter Springhouse and Roger of Chesterfield went out together for a drink at a tavern. Angry at the poor quality of the wine they were served, they complained quarrelled with the tavern keeper and threw their drinks in his face. The students proceeded to beat the tavern keeper and the brawl swift, swiftly widened. The Chancellor refused to arrest the students, who instead rang the bell of the university church, uh, that's this church here, summoning 200 others who joined in the violence against the tavern keeper, his friends, family and even the mayor. 
On the second day, the students continued their violent rampage through the town, burning houses, robbing the townspeople and closing the gates of the city. At this point, the townspeople gathered themselves to retaliate in the most brutal terms. They attacked the students with bows and arrows, beating and killing any students they could find. On the following day, the townspeople were joined by people from the countryside in ever more brutal attacks on students, killing, maiming, even scalping any they could find. Following the massacre, however, such strict reprisals were enacted against the town that it found itself subjugated so far as to be unable, really, to make any protest. And the students could now feel far more certain of their superior position. After 1355, there's very little sense of existential anxiety vis-à-vis the townspeople in Oxford. Instead, and this is very striking, I think, as a contrast between the 13th, 14th on the one hand and the 15th century on the other, we find a far higher proportion of crimes undertaken in cahoots in alliance with townsmen. The economic and jurisdictional dominance of the university meant that students no longer needed to identify themselves as against the townsmen, but could use the resources of the town and its inhabitants to engage in violence which contested dominant stereotypes by showing the scholars to be thoroughly engaged in the most worldly of worldly matters, rather than locked away in ivory towers. So, for example... In 1452, a carver named John Reed and a fishmonger called John Matthew were accused of bearing arms and wounding one John Lewes, with the help of William Ellesmere, a scholar of the College of Gloucester and various other scholars. So we've got an example of um, university scholars and townsmen working together, um, in this case against another townsman. On further investigation, it was discovered that the collaboration was of a more organised nature. The fishmonger had deliberately amassed a number of students to attack another carver named John Woodstock. Vengeance strategies seemed to have been relatively common, but the solidarities involved often crossed the town-gown divide by the 15th century. So their way of negotiating these stereotypes by the 15th century has changed substantially. As well as engaging in violence together with townsmen, students were often able to use townsmen as guarantors in the Chancellor's court, implying that alliances had been formed between the two groups. So a few examples. In March 1434, one William Rian, a mason, stood as guarantor for one Master Howell, accused of carrying arms at night. In July 1434, one Master Thomas Skibo had the stitcher John Barton as his guarantor. And subsequently, Skibo was re-arrested for extorting money under threat of violence. And interestingly, Master Skibo had been reported by another scholar, but again, his guarantor was another townsman. In 1442, one William Thonder, a scholar of Coventry Hall, was imprisoned for carrying arms but released when Thomas Gromis, a tailor, and William Wickham, a skinner, agreed to act as his guarantors. They were townsmen, obviously, and later we find them arrested for engaging in violence against a student with whom William Thonder, the scholar for whom they were standing as guarantor, had also had a hostile altercation. But lest we collapse different forms of identity too much, It is clear, I think, that such alliances were strategic rather than natural. Violence against townsmen by students continued, and as we shall see shortly, violence against townsmen's wives also continued. And increasingly, in the 15th century, this violence seems to have been socially driven, with growing numbers of cases against scholars who'd attacked the servants of other scholars and masters. For example, in September 1434, a Richard Hacklett an art student, attacked the servant of Master John Chadworth. And such cases were increasingly common. Clearly, this was one way of enacting a rivalry with another scholar, but it was also a way of asserting a superior social identity and of responding to stereotypes denigrating students as unworldly. Some of these cases add up to quite complex feuding relationships. So, for example, in 1434, the scholar Nicholas Clement ordered his men to go to the house of a rival and to attack his servants. 
They, however, and this seems to have been a mistake, went to the wrong house, that of Walter Taylor, a townsman who'd previously acted as a guarantor for a student in 1433, whose rival then deliberately attacked Taylor with a knife in 1434. So Taylor suffered two attacks in 1434 and went on to involvement in a violent brawl himself with associates of Nicholas Clement in 1439, Nicholas Clement being the original scholar. The parallels with the situation in Paris, I think, are potentially quite striking here. Prosopographical research in both areas indicates an increasingly socially elite intake of students. And in Paris, we find increasing numbers of poorer students, more often targeted in violence, explicitly claiming to protect social hierarchies. For instance, in 1432, one Guillaume angrily kicked the poverty-stricken Richard with his foot, beating him and claiming the superiority of wealth. In an era of ever-diminishing benefices to sustain the academic life, students responded to the growing ferocity of competition. In 1414, the student supporters of Ursin de Talvon, a master of theology who hoped for the Episcopate of Coutances, brutally attacked Jean Campon, the rector of the university who'd been granted it instead. And the contrast between both these towns, Oxford and Paris, and the recently founded University of Heidelberg, um, found in 1386, is also instructive. Heidelberg students found their social status explicitly mocked and targeted by the young knights in the entourage of the elector, um, the elector who'd founded the university, who must have felt their influence challenged by the elector's explicitly articulated need for scholars whose learning could be put to the use of the state. And this is not what... Um, the young knights and his entourage want to hear, really. In engaging in brutality with the young knights of the town, the students were claiming that they were something more than, quote, the tonsured and shaven ones and wearers of long tunics that their en enemies denigrated them as. These young knights had been going round describing the students in these terms. So the students in Heidelberg wielded the weapons of war just as the knights did and claimed a place in the military defence of the community. So in terms then of identifying oneself specifically as a student, there was a distinct shift in Oxford towards greater collaboration with townsmen, in part because such alliances allowed students to visualise and contest the stereotypes which denigrated them as marginalised men of God or as anarchically violent whose actions were simply youthful and ridiculous. Okay, third kind of identity I'd like to think about is gender. Um, and in this case, obviously, masculinity. <clears throat> so peer groups also heightened the stakes regarding the precarious notion of masculinity in a student context. Confronted by stereotypes of either chaste emasculation on the one hand, or uncontrolled lust on the other, students sought to manipulate and negotiate those labels. So it's been a theme of several recent books to explore the ways in which medieval students posited an extremely aggressive masculinity, both through their behaviour and through the texts which they studied. But this was just one way of responding to denigrating comments about clerical emasculation. More subtly, students sought to redefine masculinity. And one way of doing this was to subvert expected moralities through brutal behaviour. Defending one's sense of masculinity against insult was a common motivation for violence, and students were keen to depict their own actions in such a way, rendering their violence meaningful and placing their sensed masculinity centre stage. Parisian students seem to have been notorious for sleeping with prostitutes, but many went further and concomitantly at the same time manifested their supposed disapproval of the oldest profession by viciously abusing the prostitutes. So, for example, in 1424, two students were arrested for beating prostitutes. So they at once asserted a very macho nature, um, but equally suggested a brutal form of moral authority. And Oxford here presents a very different picture. Whilst students were subject to very similar labels, so 
these two sort of polarized labels of uncontrolled sexuality and you know kind of chaste emasculation in oxford the students lived in a far more morally repressive context and so i think they were bound to react differently to these labels categorizing them as either chaste or completely lecherous the chancellor's register is full of warnings against frequenting prostitutes and many prosecutions um, even for adulterous liaisons but most strikingly and distastefully in oxford the tendency by the authorities was to blame the prostitutes for any outbreaks of violence or deviant behavior and these kinds of attitudes indicated also by the notable popularity of extremely misogynist literature in late medieval Oxford. Texts decrying the evils of women were particularly widely circulated in this context. Accordingly, the Chancellor's Register in Oxford reveals periodic crackdowns and the expulsion of suspect women from Oxford, blaming them for enticing students to wickedness and even for provoking violence. For example, Alicia Clay was banished from Oxford for seducing students and blamed for promoting violent behaviour in 1443. So given this situation, I think it's very striking that very little evidence survives of Oxford student violence against prostitutes, in sharp contrast to Paris. Clearly, the Oxford authorities would have been reluctant to admit the victimhood of these women by prosecuting such cases. But perhaps their demonization also persuaded students to explore issues of gender elsewhere. So much more common in Oxford are cases of violence where students broke into the houses of married townsmen and raped their wives. A student of canon law, one Thomas um, Penny, vehemently contested allegations in 1452 that he had committed adultery with the wife of John Martin, a tailor. And more commonly, students were obliged to admit to their behaviour, and such admissions could themselves be a cause of violence. As in 1469, when Masters Stacey and Battis of Merton College came to blows over allegations, or perhaps boasts, that one or the other of them had repeatedly committed adultery with the wife of Richard Stacey, a glover, in his own dwelling. And the violence could be very brutal. In 1438, one John Ostel, a scholar from the Greek Hall, was convicted of breaking into the bedroom of Simon, an innkeeper, and hitting his, head, his wife over the head with a fire shovel prior to raping her. So these Oxford students engaged with the polarised stereotypes of emasculated clerics and irrational rapists in ways which contrasted with those of their Parisian counterparts. According at least to the surviving records, Oxford students avoided identification with the sexuality of the margins of society, i.e. prostitutes, instead contesting the normative sexual partnerships of conventional conjugality, um, many more cases of adultery um, and of breaking in and raping wives of townsmen. Such students attempted to demonstrate their sexual prowess whilst claiming their right to sleep with the married women of established society. And at the same time, I think these incidents of housebreaking were also about transgressing boundaries and moving away from the public spaces or brothels favoured by the Parisian students, amounting to an assertion by the Oxford students that they could not be excluded from the domestic life of the city. But where in sexual relations and identities, rivalries and rivalrous identities had to be consciously created and fostered, Geographical provenance provided students with pre-existing frameworks for exploring their sense of identity in relational terms. So this area, geographical provenance, is my last um, kind of identity that I'd like to discuss. In Oxford, misbehaving students engaged with identities based upon regional provenance, manipulating stereotypes of them as apolitical seekers of knowledge, whilst drawing on the fear created by labels which denigrated them as brutal and irrationally violent. So on the one hand, there's this label which suggests that students are so dedicated to learning that they have no political affiliation, and they're, they're trying to manipulate and contest that um, notion, and at the same time they're trying to show their violence isn't just irrational. But political circumstances in Oxford were quite specific, and the targets of the violence were accordingly quite particular. 
Although lacking the institutional structure of nations which shaped the university in Paris, Oxford's loose division between northerners and southerners was sufficient to provoke rivalries, witness violent battles between the two groups in 1410. However, Oxford had always been less cosmopolitan than Paris, and any foreigners who might previously have considered studying at the English university were discouraged in the 15th century by war. Um, and the chancellors of the university frequently draw attention to this decline in intake, pleading that the military health of a nation depends on its centres of learning, and that, quote, books are to scholars what arms are to soldiers. But even in this restricted context, there were nonetheless some groups which could be targeted, namely the Scottish, Irish and Welsh. Despite protestations to the contrary, I think the university authorities must have been somewhat complicit in the targeting of these groups, as the Irish were several times banned from study at the university unless already enrolled, and it's noticeable that they were prosecuted and penalised much more heavily um, than students of other geographical provenance for the same supposed crimes. The Irish and the Welsh, most particularly, tended to band together in the town. In 1443, Welsh students were accused of strutting around Oxford in bands and assaulting non-Welsh students. But their victims certainly weren't innocent. English students assailed the Welsh as groups explicitly because of their provenance. For example, during repression of Welsh revolts in the early 15th century, English students at Oxford really viciously persecuted their Welsh counterparts to the extent that the king himself sent a letter to the university requesting that such brutality should end, eliciting a highly defensive response from the university. I mean, the university's response is to say, yes, but you're doing that to the Welsh. We just want to show how supportive and politically engaged we are. The Scottish students didn't fare much better. It was so dangerous and despised to be identified as a Scot that in 1497, Master Ireland of Merton College was fined for calling Master Chamber a Scot in front of several companions. He was warned never again thus to insult somebody. So the idea is that just calling somebody a Scot is, you know, that really is um, beneath the belt. During the turbulent years of the Wars of the Roses, Oxford students perpetrated acts of violence explicitly motivated by the allegiances formed during this conflict. The year 1462 saw an edict of excommunication against all students who insulted the arms and insignia of the king and his allies through physical violence or through the use of disrespectful symbols. So the fact it's forbidden you know, demonstrates that such actions were clearly quite common. Students weren't content to allow political events to pass them by, but their engagement was also shaped by the derogatory stereotypes imposed upon them. And it's in the area of political engagement that we find the most confluence between the messages students were trying to project through their misbehaviour and those of the university itself. And um, Verger's work on 15th century Paris, I think, provides a very instructive contrast here. He's demonstrated that very convincingly, in a sense, the university shot itself in the foot in the first part of the 15th century by trying to demonstrate through its official rhetoric that it didn't take sides in the conflict, that it was above such worldly matters. And here, I think, we have a clear disjunction between students who were anxious to show themselves engaged in practical politics through attacks on students of different political persuasions and official university rhetoric which tried to distance itself from the conflict. And Verger shows that it's for this very neutrality that the university was effectively punished in the second half of the century, losing many of its privileges because it had failed to prove its political relevance. But in Oxford, there was far less disjunction between students and university authorities on this matter. Both groups were pretty desperate to demonstrate that the university was politically engaged and were particularly keen to counter and contest any notion that the university was an ivory tower with little real relevance to the well-being of the kingdom as a whole. So we find comments like, quote, Books are as necessary to us as weapons are to soldiers. By them we are enabled to defend the church and overthrow heretics. Help us in our bloodless warfare. 
the university once prosperous is reduced to the greatest misery, so deadly is the wound from which she suffers by the insubordination of violence of the ill-disposed, that lectures have ceased and a complete ruin of education is imminent. History shows that where learning is encouraged, the state prospers, and though these troubles are but among the youth of the university, they are an index of national feeling. So, so clearly the university authorities didn't see the violence in which students engaged as the right answer. But both groups, i.e. the authorities and the students, were engaged on a programme of contesting stereotypes, condemning them to the margins of political life. And both were claiming, through their words and actions, centrality in the political life of the kingdom. And the authorities, in a sense, joined in the xenophobic discourse of the students with words rather than actions, by claiming that foreigners, particularly Frenchmen, were attempting to infiltrate the university, discrediting the institution and trying to damage the national cause. It's a very wild accusation of um, spying. Um, and in a sense, what the university is trying to do is say, you know, these really important political things do actually happen here. We do matter to the political life of the kingdom. So students, masters and university authorities, in a sense, found themselves caught in a contradiction. If they wanted to demonstrate their importance to the kingdom, the university needed to be presented as a place of peace. Maliciously represented, that's a quote from one of these letters, and quote, slandered against. But at the same time, those actions by students which were picked up, up on by commentators were also deliberately designed to indicate political engagement and involvement in the well-being of the kingdom. Negotiating and contesting stereotypes was no straightforward matter and engendered contradictions and tensions. So in this sense, I thought I might conclude by taking a swift look at the portrayal of the student Nicholas in Chaucer's Miller's Tale. So the story, I think, is well known. Nicholas is a student at Oxford who's taken lodgings with the carpenter John. Nicholas is in love with Alison, the carpenter's young wife, and his love is requited. But he longs to spend longer in her arms, so he hatches a clever plan to convince the miller that second flood is coming. The miller takes refuge in a tub, um, which he has um, suspended from the ceiling so that he's all ready for when the waters rise. Nicholas and Alison take the opportunity to spend a wild night together, but are interrupted by Alison's other suitor, the clerk Absalon, who sticks a red hot poker between the cheeks of Nicholas's buttocks. Nicholas screams loudly for water, waking the miller John, who, believing that the flood has now come, cuts the rope holding his tub up um, and crashes to the ground and breaks his arm. So Chaucer was not an Oxford student, and he's using tropes which were much older than the late 14th century when he was writing. Um, the Fabio spring immediately to mind as sources for this story. But the particular treatment which Chaucer gives his theme indicates the clever ways in which students played with and manipulated the stereotypes with which they were so often condemned. On hearing that the story is about a student, the medieval listeners both extra and intratextual in the framing narrative, know that some kind of cheeky misdeed is likely to follow. So the character of Nicholas is created out of a sense that students were mischievous and cheeky. But the character is immediately categorised as a scholarly figure who sits studying in his room at the start of the story. And this description is clearly supposed to be funny because this image of the conscientious student clashed so outrageously with the sense that students were in many cases, disruptive and naughty. And the character of Nicholas is shown exploiting this tension between the two stereotypes. He's keen to demonstrate his superior intelligence and learning as compared with a stupid Miller, but he's equally keen to show that this intelligence is not of an unworldly kind. And in terms of masculinity, he's very clearly attempting to show that his own sexuality is superior and more powerful than that of the Miller or of Absalom. At the same time, the character demonstrates that his misbehaviour is not just of a frivolous or meaningless kind, um, as student misbehaviour was so often denigrated as being. It's clever, it's planned, strategic. But if Chaucer via the Miller effectively depicts a student cleverly manipulating stereotypes, that student is not given the last word as he emerges at the end with horribly scorched buttocks. 
but then nor do any other characters emerge unscathed. They all suffer and lose face by the end of the story. So Chaucer presents us with a student engaged in defending and manipulating his own sense of identity, engaging with the ways in which others were speaking of him, but ultimately caught in a web of labelling and counteraction, which, although funny, could be profoundly disruptive. Thank you. Thank you.